Crystal Servants, a Ryland Throne short story, written by John M. Olson, read by Zach Bjorgi. The rumors around the castle described Adrian Albin as a ghost. As one of the king's spies, Adrian didn't mind, since he'd spent years learning to be where people weren't looking. Besides, it opened a whole world of pranks to him that others could never manage. He sauntered along the cobblestone street beside Draken, the king's newest weapons trainer. Neither of them fit the mold society expected as servants of the king, and they had become fast friends. The smell of recent rain hung in the evening air as Draken's ebony complexion and cropped black hair made him all but invisible against the unlit street. His short leather cloak dyed to a dark mottled brown completed the effect. Adrian glanced forward to his trip line, tied off to a loose stone on the corner of the building they walked beside. The timing had to be perfect to spring the special trap on Draken. From the alley between buildings came a yell of surprise that abruptly cut off, leaving the night quiet. Adrian held out an arm to stop Draken as they reached the corner, then held a finger to his lips. The shadows beckoned to him as he crept into the dark for a better look. Adrian could take out a thug or a robber without breaking a sweat, but the scene within the alley stopped him cold. There stood Colin Lightmore, the nephew of a powerful baron, standing over a man sprawled on the ground. A thumb-sized crystal hung from Lightmore's neck on a chain, a symbol of both his wealth and power. He was a dangerous man to cross. Only nobles in the army used such magic crystals to control war animals for the king. Thank you for the information, but I no longer need your services. Lightmore drew a slim dagger and plunged it downward in a vicious killing blow. Adrian froze in the shadows as he considered his options. Would Draken keep the secret if Adrian attacked and killed the noble for his crime? That was a burden he refused to force on his friend. Could they report the attack and testify to the king without getting entangled in politics? The young killer would go free, able to seek vengeance at his leisure. There was no good choice. Behind him, a stone fell to the cobbles. Lightmore's head whipped around at the noise. There was Draken, silhouetted against the windows across the street, plain to see as he squinted into the darkness. The trip line snaked up into the air and vanished. He didn't know whether to cry in despair or to laugh at the improbability of it all. Adrian sprinted from the shadows to the corner a few short paces away. Run! He grabbed at Draken's sash to pull him along as he flew past, counting silently. Clanks of wood against wood and the quiet squeak of rope over a pulley came from above. They might make it. Boots skidded along the cobbles of the alley behind Adrian as Lightmore closed the gap between them. Lightmore reached the corner where he and the walkway were both splattered with great gobs of sticky black mud meant originally for Draken. Adrian led them through a series of random turns before he stopped to listen. The sound of distant cursing wafted through the air. He put his back to the noise and led them to a major street. How do you see so well? I can't see a thing out here and you run like it's full sun. Adrian sighed. I told you not to look at the lit windows as you pass them. It ruins your night sight. We need to go this way. He's over on Wheelwright Street still. Should I stop listening to the windows as well, since they ruin my night hearing? I don't know how you do it. It's a combination of training and my naturally amazing skills. Whatever you say. Now tell me what happened back there. Who was that? Do you know him? A somber mood fell on the conversation as Adrian chewed his lip. Colin Lightmore received something from a servant or a messenger, then killed him. I don't know who the dead man was or what he gave to Lightmore. And you ran? What's wrong with you? We work for the king. It would have been easy to explain why we got involved. Killed or captured, it sounds like a simple case. Adrian wanted to yell at him, but the Baron's nephew might hear and give chase once more. He clenched his jaw. He's a nephew of Baron Lightmore. That makes it even worse. Nobles should be, well, noble. Examples, protectors of the people. Adrian held in a barking laugh. 
and they ride unicorns and give treats to orphan children as they sing of joy and peace. I think you have an inflated view of nobles. They turned into a larger street, cleaner than the small ones that led toward the castle. Scattered groups walked the wide street enjoying the early nighttime air as Draken said, I don't expect perfection, but I do expect them to uphold the law and be subject to justice. He shouldn't get away with this. I agree in principle, but it's more complicated than you think. I'm subtle and work from the shadows. Not everything is a case of point weapons. Dispense justice. Draken grunted as if everything should be so simple. You just don't want to bring Charisse into it. Ask her tonight when you get to your room. She's on the city guard, so she'll know how to handle such things. His wife of less than a year knew her duty to the guard and the king. What would she say other than lawbreakers should be punished? She didn't judge, she protected. It was wrong to let a murderer go free, but as a spy he lurked and gathered information through stealth and subterfuge without exposing his intentions or his methods. Frontal assaults were not his forte despite his skill with a blade. Adrian avoided the glare of the occasional oil street lamps as he maintained a watch on their tail for a mud-covered noble, but Lightmore made no appearance. They walked the rest of the way to the castle in silence along the sparsely lit street. Adrian entered the servants' dining hall after lunch had begun and eased up behind Draken, who had saved him a seat. The meal of dark bread and vegetable stew tickled at his nose as he identified the scents. Plenty of onions and potatoes, but they had skimped on carrots and spices again. It would do. He brushed Draken's left shoulder and sat on his right, deftly sliding his friend's soup bowl away while Draken glanced to his left. Draken turned back, poked a spoon into the table where his bowl had been, and let out a sigh. <sighs> you did it again. I expected it, and you still succeeded. He pulled his soup bowl back in front of himself with a scowl. I must keep practice, even if it's at your expense, my friend. Adrian pulled a bowl and spoon for himself from a tray in the middle of the long oak table and tore a chunk from a loaf of aromatic bread. Dragon looked around, then said, I've been thinking. Certainly a bad habit to get into. I avoid it whenever possible. Adrian dipped his bread and bit into it with gusto. Can you be serious for a minute? I'll give it my best effort. Adrian turned to Draken with a look of intense concentration. Draken glanced about again. Lightmore needs to see justice. What he did was wrong. Adrian looked at his bread as if it held the mysteries of the universe. He's done nothing but what they all do. We happen to see it is all. Do you expect to bring the entirety of the noble houses to justice? I talked to Cherise like you asked. She said the nobles are a law to themselves. I've seen the same. To interfere is to court death. It has to start somewhere, or nothing will ever change. What makes it your job, Draken? Draken's voice raised above their hushed tones. Colin Lightmore is a blight upon his family and upon the kingdom! Heads turned their way and the noise of spoons and bowls ceased for a moment, then resumed. Adrian lowered his voice to barely a whisper. Careful, Draken! You don't want the attention that sort of talk will get you. He's a powerful man from a powerful family. Sure, you're one of the king's employees a trainer because of your skill with sword and crystal. That might not save you if he takes an interest in you. Draken tipped up his bowl and drank down the remaining broth. Then he set the empty bowl on a stack near the serving tray. He shook his head. Something must be done. Even if it's to make someone an example, it could help. Draken's white knuckles and the knots in his jaw hinted at dangerous decisions. It was time to intervene before he took out his frustrations on a clueless trainee in afternoon weapon practice. I'm in the mood to attend your practice. What do you say I slip in among the students, and we show them the old thrust and block trick? I don't need your help today. Draken swung his legs up and over the bench to face out as he prepared to leave. Shots and splinters, man! Remember the time you broke a student's hand? You're more distracted than that today. I'm coming with you. Adrian drained his bowl and tossed it into the stack, then followed Draken out the door, munching on the last of his bread. The new recruits flailed hopelessly with their wooden practice swords, dashing Adrian's dreams of an easy training session. These men wouldn't do much for the war-thinned ranks of the army. 
The nobles were nearly as useless, having become complacent and idle after their victory, reveling in their undeserved success. The situation was a disaster looking for a place to happen. Adrian removed his palace sash and mingled among the trainees. Draken gathered them together after a pitiful few minutes with the wooden practice swords. It was time to teach them something useful whether they wanted to learn or not. They would either learn valuable skills or learn to fear those who could kill them. Either way was a win in Adrian's mind. Exasperated, Draken stood before them with a wooden practice sword drawn. How hard can it be? Block, then thrust! He showed them the movements. The students stared back as if he spoke in his native language instead of their own, in comprehension clear on their faces as they shuffled and stirred up dust that smelled of straw and animal dung. Fine. One of you lot step forward and I'll show you. Y you there! He pointed at Adrian. It warmed Adrian's heart that he was at least playing along after the serious lunch conversation. This would be fun and perhaps enlighten the students better than boring rote drills. Draken said, You swing at me first and I will block and thrust. Then you block and thrust. We keep at it until I call a stop. Adrian gave an accurate, but slow, chop with a wooden sword he'd swiped from a student. Draken parried it and returned a thrust, giving Adrian a chance to do the same block and thrust again. They increased their speed. Then they increased it again. Soon their wooden swords blurred through the air, click clacking into a crescendo of impacts. Draken gave Adrian a wink to signal the end of the game. They swung in simultaneously. The fake swords hit flat to flat between them and both shattered, sending a numbing shock through his fingers on the hilt as splinters flew in all directions. The students stood with mouths agape as Adrian eased back through them, targeting the spots where the students didn't look as he moved. The skill had taken him years to develop. He left the hilt and broken blade beside the student he'd pilfered it from and slipped away to a shadowy corner while they looked at Draken with new appreciation. Draken tossed aside his broken practice sword, grabbed another, and pointed at one of his students. You next. Adrian hoped none of the students ended up in bandages. At least Dragon had bled off the worst of his tension in their high-speed practice. Now to see if he would forget the whole thing and let life settle back to normal. He put the whole matter behind him as he made his way to his room. Charisse would be amused at his stories of the day, except that she usually defended Draken just to be contrary. Adrian waited on the roof edge, watching the door to the king's audience chamber. Draken's summons had come mid-morning, pulling him from a crystal training class with newly approved military men. Not everyone was well suited to controlling the body of an animal, so it was part of Draken's job to find those with proper temperament to absorb the senses and control the actions of animals ranging from nimble wolves to large armored bears. With the end of the war not long past, the military still had not replaced those lost when a dozen of the king's crystal-trained men had been overrun and butchered. That training could wait for later in the day, as Draken faced the king and his advisors. It had to be about his outburst yesterday. If only Adrian had found the passage he believed to exist in the rafters of the council chamber. The castle hoarded a trove of secrets, and the head spymaster had not seen fit to show him all the entrances and hidden passages. Adrian had found many passages on his own, but a few eluded him. A short time later, Draken emerged from the hall with a guard who stopped outside the door and watched him trudge his way back to the training compound. Adrian slipped hand over hand down a water spout to land lightly on the ground. Draken marched with his head down and his hands balled into fists. It hadn't gone well then. Adrian picked up his pace and stepped in beside Draken, matching his stride. Well? Draken flinched at his sudden appearance, but for once didn't berate him for sneaking. It was horrible. The king defended him. Defended! He threatened me with the dungeon if I cause him any more embarrassment. It's worse than I'd imagined, and the corruption runs all the way to the top. You were right. This is beyond me. Adrian raised an eyebrow. Draken bully. Quitting from a fight. Now this is news. It's welcome news in this case, but unexpected. No, not quitting. Well, yes, maybe. 
It might be best for all if I step down as trainer for the king if I can't support him with my every effort. You, sir, are an idealist. This world doesn't suit you. Adrian hated to see his friend in such a moral knot, but let him make the choices and live with the consequences. Perhaps he could dangle some information to sway him rather than tell him what to do. The man's sheer stubbornness was both a strength and a weakness, depending on whether you knew how to manipulate him with it. After a few moments of silence, Adrian continued, In my line of work, I found I can do more behind the scenes than I could manage in the open. You might consider what you can do without bringing attention to yourself. Draken shrugged as he walked. At home, I learned to serve with honor, and to serve those who deserve that honor. Then why are you here, Draken? Draken's lips narrowed to a line as he scowled. Adrian counted it as a direct hit on his friend's ego as he waited for an answer. Draken replied, I found my master lacking in honor. I left my people and came north. Adrian held up a finger. Exactly. If you run into a problem everywhere you go, perhaps you should consider the problem is with your expectations. With a bit of luck, his friend might understand that mere mortals could never meet his expectations of perfection. Draken said, I have work to do. The dismissal was clear in his voice. Adrian would let him stew in his thoughts. Adrian delivered a set of new reports to the spymaster, then wandered his way to the practice yard to meet Draken as the workday ended. The trainees lay in trances on cots as they marched the crystal-trained wolves back to the kennels in formation. One by one they ended their control trances and wobbled to their feet. The dizziness of pulling back from controlling an animal happened even to the best trained soldier. They poked fun at each other over their weaknesses as they filed out of the training yard through a stone archway. If they could find humor in their shared vulnerability, then maybe there was hope for them to learn teamwork and soldiering after all. Adrian slipped into the yard between the exiting trainees. There was a broken training sword on the ground again, but there was no sign of blood. That was good. Draken looked up early, spoiling his stealthy approach. Eagerness lit his expression as he said, I took your advice. Adrian thought for a moment. Which advice was that? I give you quite a bit of advice, and you normally throw it in the compost yard. I know where the true problem lies. I thought it through. I thought... I was right to think corruption was rampant among the nobles. That much is clear. Adrian stepped closer, a quick glance verifying none could hear them. All the trainees had left for the evening meal. We never disagreed on that point. The trouble was in acting on it. But you see, I assumed the corruption was complete. That's where I was wrong. There must be others besides us who have not fallen into idleness and debauchery. Adrian pinched the bridge of his nose. That's not what I advised you to do. It will end in disaster if you keep at it. Draken continued as if Adrian had agreed with everything so far. With the right allies, we can exert influence and lend our hand to their work. The others will be forced into line by their peers, or be pruned from the ranks, and order will return. It was good that Draken had eased up on his idea of an active part in a great purge of infidels, even though his idealism still burned like a beacon. This might work out after all. What noble would champion the cause of a weapons trainer and an intelligence agent? That bright emotional beacon would run low over time. Draken would become jaded with his failure, and they could go on about their lives, both enjoying the good favor of the king. Adrian picked up a splinter of wood and picked at his fingernails. You're right to leave the nobles to keep order among themselves, even if you help one here or there. It was a twist on what Draken had said, but the subtle change to increase the distance between his friend and the noose of treason could pay off if he turned it into a less personal issue. Draken nodded somberly. I can't issue a duel challenge to a noble. The challenges must come from a noble. When the king warned me, he didn't use the word treason, but he danced around it. The only proper path is to seek out nobles who are not corrupt, and to ally with them. A warm evening breeze brought smells of the common market to Adrian as he walked with Charisse, a rare pleasure when they both had an evening free. I have no need for vengeance, yet Draken has taken the behavior of this one man, and nearly all nobles, as a personal affront. I try to discourage him, but he doesn't see things the way I do. 
Well, they can be a troublesome lot at times, Cherise said, squeezing his arm. The pressure of her hand reassured him as they watched Dusk overcome the city. He's going to get himself into trouble or killed. I have no interest in watching him die on this particular hill. I'd have nobody to practice my skills on. Do you still sneak up on him? Shame on you, startling a man who's jumpier than a cat in a room of rocking chairs. Cherise made a tisk-tisk noise and gave a playfully disapproving look. Adrian prepared his best offense, but Cherise pulled him to a stop before he could say a word. She pointed to one of the few market stalls still occupied in the dusk. A man wrapped in a leather cloak pushed the merchant deeper into his stall as the merchant's eyes darted around. He stumbled back and motioned for the cloaked man to wait. The bully toyed with a short dagger as he spoke to the merchant. Cherise said, Work calls. She disengaged from his arm and drew a dagger from its sheath. You're not in uniform, and that dagger might only make him angry. He knew better than to think he could talk Cherise out of defending the merchant and taking the other man into custody, so he altered tactics. I'll come in from the other side to back you up. See how he is facing to the left, away from that next stall. They split to either side and ran into the market. He winced at the sound of her boots against the cobblestones, loud enough for anyone to hear. She worked the market from time to time, so it would be rude to step in unless the situation turned against her. The caped man didn't respond until she stepped up less than five paces away and called, City Guard! Drop your weapon! The man sneered as he turned to her. This merchant and I have business. It's none of yours. You don't look like a city guard. Be on your way, girl. He waved at the main path with his dagger as the merchant cowered and looked from one to the other. Adrian maintained his position in the growing shadows, within a few steps of the argument. He held a dagger by the tip, ready to throw in case the thug threatened the merchant or Charisse, or tried to flee. Charisse punched him in the chest before the man could return his dagger to a defensive position, forcing him back and down into a sitting position with a thump that raised a small cloud of dust. Charisse said, I don't think so. The merchant's tongue loosened at her display of skill. He threatened to kill me if I didn't give him my money bag. I have no idea who he is. Cherise focused on her opponent and said without turning, That will go into my report. Now your dagger. Scoot it to me. The man on the ground obliged, and the blade clattered across the stones. Now we go to the market guard station. Get up and walk. The merchant babbled his thanks over and over as the robber got to his feet facing Cherise. His hands fumbled within his cloak for a moment, and the faint scrape of a knife coming out of its sheath reached Adrian's ears. Adrian took a breath to yell a warning, but it was too late. The man lashed out with his hidden blade and scored a cut along Cherise's forearm as she leapt back and brought her own blade down, trimming the man's fingers at the second knuckle on his weapon hand. Before Adrian's thoughts could completely form, the dagger flew from his fingers. It hit and sank up to the hilt to the left of the man's spine. The man in the leather cloak coughed, spit blood, and fell. Charisse looked at the man on the ground, then at Adrian. What was that for? You think I couldn't handle a simple thug like him? He barely scratched me. The clatter of hooves and boots approached along the main path as the merchant, Charisse, and Adrian stared at the fallen man. Adrian glanced over, expecting to see guards approach, but instead saw a nobleman riding behind four footmen, one holding a banner. Stout Heart Barony, from the north border, one of few not to go lax after the war. Even in the twilight it was easy to recognize Baron Gerald Stout Heart's imposing figure and piercing gaze. It seems you've saved us some trouble. We've been tracking this man to arrest him. The merchant repeated his refrain. He threatened to kill me! Baron Stout Heart dismounted and came over to face Adrian, who gestured at Charisse and said, She's the off-duty city guard who intercepted your target, sir. If it pleases you, I should take care of her injury. The baron eyed her as if weighing and measuring her worth, then gave an appreciative nod. The baron's men gathered up the robber's body and carried him away as the baron watched. Certainly. Do what you must. You did well here tonight. He lowered his voice so not even the merchant could hear as he continued. Tell your friend Draken and Boli that not all nobles have gone soft. I'll be in touch. The best plans often take a great deal of time. 
The Baron left with his men, and Adrian handed Charisse his sash to staunch the bleeding. I'm worried about how wide Draken's words have spread, Charisse said. That Baron is a pig, but not the same kind of pig Draken's upset about. He lied about that thug. I would have heard through the master of the guard. Besides, he didn't say a word to me, even after giving me the full up and down with his beady little eyes. Trust me, I know his type. Well then, how about we get you to the castle, clean that arm, then search the kitchens for a ham to celebrate our superiority over pigs? Charisse leaned dangerously close to agreeing with Draken's plans, and the injury wasn't doing her mental state any good. He would pass along the Baron's message, but he didn't have to like it. Adrian watched from his hiding place at the end of an alley as the noon bell rang in the distance. His assignment to make a note of the customers of a particular blacksmith was complete for the morning, and he signaled his replacement. His vagabond disguise itched, but he couldn't change before meeting Draken for lunch at the edge of the market. It was trivial to slink along in the shadows out of everyone's view. The disguise made it even easier to blend in without his usual sash and clean clothing. To the common eye, he was one more bit of human refuse, blowing along the street, something to avoid. Draken had been unusually specific about lunch, asking to meet at fifteen minutes after the noon bell. Adrian hurried on his way, dodging people, horses, and handcarts on the street. One side effect of working to be unseen was that he did all the work to avoid collisions. He backed off a little on his stealth as he picked up the pace. Finally, he rounded the corner and gazed out upon the market, and across to the far side to their favorite lunch spot. The quarter bell rang. He was late. Across the market, Colin Lightmore rode up, dismounted, and called out to Draken. People scattered as Draken stood to face him. "'I hear you don't like me, Draken,' said the noble. "'While that's any man's right, you've also insulted me. You said I am a blight upon my family and upon the kingdom. What does a simple foreigner like you know about nobles? For instance, do you know the rules of dueling?' Lightmore drew out a glove and tossed it to the ground. I choose rapiers, here and now, to the death. One of his men presented Draken with a lightweight rapier as Adrian slunk closer through the crowd that surged away from the danger. A rapier? Lightmore had done his homework. They were barred from other weapons until the fight ended. Draken excelled at heavier blades where brute force helped. The finesse of a slender weapon was foreign to him. Lightmore's speed and fencing experience gave him the advantage. No wonder Lightmore had declared it to the death. Draken was doomed. Draken stood and took the weapon in a proper fencing grip. It figures you'd choose a foppish weapon. It makes me wonder what you're attempting to defend since you have neither honor nor manliness. Draken had pulled all the stops and used his words as a weapon, scoring a verbal hit before the physical battle had begun. Lightmore's face contorted in rage. Block and thrust, the weapons... The weapons were a lot lighter than the wooden practice swords, but Draken kept it simple and followed his own teachings. Not bad, but either you or your trainer is fond of shortcuts. Shamefully sloppy work. Adrian fiddled with the dagger at his belt, itching to intervene, but not daring. This was a formal duel, and it was entirely in Draken's hands. Lightmore's jaw clenched as he lunged again aiming the deadly tip at Draken's weakly defended left side. Draken parried the attack, knocking it to the side, but didn't return with a thrust. Instead, he said, I don't think you're taking this seriously. He flicked the tip of his rapier, back too far to be a threat, but the crowd watching wouldn't know that. Draken made Lightmore look the fool as he toyed with him and avoided close contact. Perhaps you're wary of getting mud on your fancy clothes again? Draken glanced across the crowd and met Adrian's eyes and winked before locking back on his opponent. The puzzle pieces all sat before Adrian. Draken was about to do something both dangerous and foolish and might live to tell the tale. You were there! Lightmore's wild eyes lit with fury as he renewed his attack. Draken parried Lightmore's next attack, but knocked it high where it pierced Draken's short cloak and sliced a deep groove into his right shoulder. Draken yelled as he lunged forward, Lightmore's blade caught in the cloak between them. Draken's injury turned his arm slick with blood as he dropped his rapier. His right hand hung at his side, useless. 
His left arm wrapped and pulled Lightmore in tight, then Draken spit in his eye. Despite grinding his teeth, Draken said, Yes, I was there when you killed your servant. You bring shame to the Lightmore name and to the kingdom. Lightmore was too close and his weapon hung locked in place between them. His left hand reached for a belt sheath where he pulled a dagger. Nobody would care that Lightmore broke the dueling code and Draken would be dead in moments. Adrian's dagger flashed out across the impromptu dueling arena and it embedded itself in Lightmore's back, a copy of his attack earlier against the robber. Lightmore's dagger clattered to the ground as his eyes grew wide. He stumbled back, letting go of his rapier, before he crumpled with a wet gasp. Draken nodded to Adrian, then stumbled to a chair with the rapier still lodged in his cloak. He looked to Adrian. Through clamped teeth, he said, more politely than Adrian had ever heard, If you could find me a bandage, I would be in your debt. Debt? Oh, you owe me more than I can count, and I can count to a lot. Now, to see if we live long enough for me to collect from you. Everyone with common sense cleared the area long before the city guard arrived. Adrian could have sneaked off any number of times, but it was no good. Everyone would soon know he had interrupted a duel and killed a noble. A cheating, good-for-nothing murdering weasel, but a noble nonetheless. Worse, Draken had tricked Adrian into helping by purposely provoking Lightmore to break the rules. At least Charisse wasn't in the troop of guards that arrested both Adrian and Draken. Adrian marched into the king's court, armed guards before and after, even though he wore shackles at ankles and wrists. The king must have remembered his particular skill set since the guards had hammered nails through the keyholes. His heart leapt as he entered. Cherie stood guard beside the door with her forearm wrapped. Their eyes met for only the briefest of moments, an eternity, in which to beg forgiveness, and in which to sorrow for things that might not come to pass. Several nobles sat in the audience, along with a smattering of others wealthy enough not to be denied out of hand. Lightmores were there in force, filling a bench with both near and distant relatives who either visited or lived in the capital. Baron Stoutheart sat on the aisle, his face an unreadable stone mask. Draken sat on the bench for the accused, and Adrian shuffled over to sit beside him. Draken wore regular shackles. Adrian toyed with the idea of unlocking his friend for the amusement of it, but figured that might go badly for Draken, who technically had broken no law. His deft fingers ran over his own shackles instead, out of habit. Everyone rose as King Vargas entered, flanked by members of his personal guard in navy blue. The Lightmore family, powerful in the upper circles of government, had appealed to the king before any lower court could address this issue of their slain kinsmen. The king had agreed since Dragon and Adrian were on the king's payroll. The king sat, followed by the attendees. He glared as he looked around the room as if daring anyone to speak out to further complicate his mourning. We are here to determine the fate of these two men, he nodded to the accused bench. Mboli Draken is accused of provoking one Colin Lightmore, nephew of Baron Lightmore, as he was in town on special assignment as my advisor. Under his breath, Adrian said, Oops. Draken let out a long breath, but held his tongue, thankfully. Despite the trouble, he still cared what his friend thought and wanted to see him through this trial. Adrian's own fate was likely beyond repair. The king continued, Young Colin had no option but to defend his honor and challenge Draken to a duel. First blood should have ended the conflict. Adrian stood. If I may, your majesty. An advisor to the side of the king said, The accused must not speak unless addressed. Adrian put his boldest expression on and continued, You see, the court is discussing Draken and Borley's case now. I have a statement pertinent to his defense. The king hesitated, then nodded. Continue. As you know, my job requires exact memory and recitation of details. The king has commended me on my accuracy in the past. I will recite Colin Lightmore's challenge for you. Adrian switched to mimic the voice of Lightmore and said, I choose rapiers, here and now, to the death. Gasps rose from the Lightmore bench at the perfect tone and accent of his mimicry. The effect was clear and precisely what Adrian had hoped for. The king straightened in his chair and glared at one of his advisors. He hadn't known. After a long moment, the king said, Does anyone dispute this? 
There were well over a dozen witnesses. Nun stepped forward. Adrian smiled. Draken, you may now address the court. Draken stood and looked first to the king, then to the audience. He had all the tools to gain his freedom. One quick apology and he would walk free. Colin Lightmore killed his own servant. He was, as I said, a vile young man, undeserving of the honor of a noble name. He challenged me. He is now dead. Adrian wanted nothing more than to slap some sense into Draken. The fool had thrown away a perfect setup. Adrian should have winked at him as a clue. It might still be rescued if Draken pandered to the Lightmores in the chamber. Draken sat as the room became utterly silent. The king took a deep breath, then another. Finally, he said, It is my judgment that Imoli Draken broke no law worthy of the king's punishment, yet has shown he lacks the scruples to endure the society that welcomed him. The king turned to address Draken directly. You understand directness. I will be direct. You will leave the capital. You will never return. If you do, I will see you strung up by your angles over the main gate until the birds pick you clean and your carcass falls due to rot. He turned to a guard. Unlock him and see him out. With his shackles removed, Draken walked to the exit. Baron Stoutheart spoke a few words to him as he passed. While others might have only picked out a mumble, Adrian heard something about honor and ability in the Baron's words. At least Draken would live, and not everyone hated him. The king spoke once more. Now we must face the matter of Colin Lightmore's killer. Adrian Albin was not a party to the duel. He intervened when Lightmore allegedly reached for a second weapon, despite his pledge to use only the rapier in the duel. It was close enough. Adrian had a little room to work with, so he made mental notes and awaited his turn to speak. He had faced death before, but this challenge was all mental, rather than a contest of physical skill or stealth. As both Lightmore and Adrian Albin are sworn servants to the king, it pains me to lose valuable resources. Lightmore did something unheard of in duels. If he had given a standard challenge, he would have won at first blood. He was rash. Yet Adrian interfered, having no right by authority or assignment to harm one of the noble birth. Does anyone wish to add anything or contest this summary? Adrian caught a movement out of the corner of his eye as Baron Stoutheart made a hand signal to the king, but did not speak. The king leaned back in his ornate seat. Adrian Albin, you may speak. Adrian stood, setting aside his shackles. The nails had been the trickiest part. My dear king, it has been an honor to serve you, second only to the honor of marrying my dear Charisse. I regret having killed one of your servants without permission, yet my honor allowed no other outcome. The implications hung in the air. Some would recognize the subtext of dishonor and betrayal. The king wouldn't care, but someone might. With an ornate bow out of style for years, Adrian said, I submit myself to your judgment. Was it enough to sway the king? He'd talked his way out of tight spots before. Baron Stoutheart stood. Your Majesty, there is the matter of a second death. A second death? The Baron had set him up. Adrian lunged for the Baron, but two guards blocked his path. One of them swung a short sword, but it clanged to a halt against Cherise's spear before it could strike Adrian down. Adrian looked at her, sadness filling his heart. He didn't deserve her. The king bellowed, Enough! Once silence fell over the room, he said, she prefers to save you rather than serve me, so she will join you. The judgment is death. Adrian sorrowed that she'd thrown her lot in with him, whether by choice or by instinct. It wasn't fair to her. She was strong and had a purpose to her life. He was merely a clever prankster. The king shook his head in disappointment. It is to be death by declaration. Adrian, for your attack... Also, your wife who repelled against the guard within my court. I declare you both dead from this moment, no longer persons, no longer deserving protections as subjects or as human beings. The accords of the Crystal Kings demand that no person be bound and controlled by a crystal. 
since you are neither alive nor human, collaring you is no longer a crime. A life as a meat puppet was still life, and Cherise had not overstepped so far as to be put to death immediately. It was good enough. The room cleared and the king left, aside from royal and city guards who hemmed in Adrian and Cherise. A blacksmith arrived and clicked a collar into place on both prisoners. He pulled a wire and the locking mechanism flared with heat against his neck. The locks are fused, Adrian. Your tricks won't do any good on these. Each collar bore a crystal mounted to its inside where it rode against the skin. Baron Stoutheart approached as the room emptied. He kicked the chains Adrian had worn. I don't know why they even tried to keep you chained. He looked between Cherise and Adrian. Quite the bargain. I had only arranged for one servant and one slave, and here I have an extra. He looked Cherise over as he had before, as if evaluating a farm animal for suitability. I'm sure you'll prove valuable. I hate to see such talent go to waste. The blacksmith delivered two crystals to the baron, both on gold chains. With those, Adrian and Cherise could be made to do or say anything under control of the baron or whoever wore the crystal. The nobles played their games. Everyone else was a piece on the game board, pushed around to gain advantage and power. Stoutheart was a master at the game. He'd arranged everything in advance, and Adrian had never seen it coming. As a master of information, he'd been blind to the machinations going on around him until it was too late. Stoutheart dismissed the guard. Draken dispensed his justice and lived to tell the tale. That's quite a feat in this environment. I commend you on your work, although I expect you to be harder to steer. Adrian raised an eyebrow. You planned all this. I saw an opportunity, and I took it. One less dilettante to worry about, and I get new servants. I've saved your lives through a difficult and expensive set of negotiations, because you can help me to do great things. I don't expect gratitude, but if you fight me, you will regret it for a long time. He tapped the gold chains in his hand before putting a crystal around his neck. The one that matched Charisse's collar. Adrian sensed a game piece moving on the board in his head to enforce his obedience. Baron Stoutheart was many things, but subtle was not one of them. We leave from the main gate at dawn. Don't make me hunt you down. He tapped the crystal at his neck, then turned and strode from the room. Adrian's life was not his own, but he had a path forward. He clutched Cherise's hand with his own and stared into her eyes, unsure who showed the most apprehension and fear. He would do whatever Baron Stoutheart required to keep her safe, or go mad trying. 